Welcome to another episode of PG Radio. Um, before I go on to introduce the the guest that I had for this conversation, who I am sure you will find just what an interesting conversation overall. Let me give you a little bit of a precursor on why I ended up having this conversation. And I mean, anybody who's read the title of this conversation will be like, eh, Prakhar, aren't you a little late taking Twitter seriously? But I really don't think so. So when the coronavirus hit the world, you know, sometime around March, when when stuff began to get shut down in the United States, and we were around the point where India was going to shut down too, where the world was talking about the pandemic, where the world was talking about quarantines and lockdowns, I started wondering how exactly, how exactly, not in a science fiction way, but how exactly, how tangibly is the world going to change in the coming months, right? And I started wondering about that and I started exploring in many, many directions. It was obvious that the world was going to move to more virtual spaces, but what does that mean for the real world was the question for me. In the course of that question, I remember I was researching how New York City became New York City, right? How New York City since 1776, since Alexander Hamilton became what it is now, this modern marvel, this, this, this human adult adventure park that it has come to be. And so in the course of understanding why New York City is New York City, I came across this concept, which is at the corner of why New York City is the way it is. The, the most fundamental reason why New York City is New York City is something called agglomeration economies. And agglomeration economies is a simple concept. Suppose you and I work at Wall Street downtown, right? I work from the office across from you. I get out of my office, I climb down the building, you get out of your office, you climb down your building, we both meet at the deli downstairs, I get a coffee, I get a sandwich, you get a salad and a coffee, we both sit down, I look at you, I was like, by the way, dude, I have this interesting idea, and you listen to my idea, and that is it, and that is all agglomeration economies, in some sense, roughly speaking, are made out of. Agglomeration economies is the passage of ideas between extremely diversely skilled individuals. In some sense, New York City is New York City because of the passage of ideas that the population of New York City has allowed. For whatever want or reason, for whatever infrastructural reasons, it is because ideas flourish in New York City that New York City flourishes economically. And while researching about all of that, I realized that it, it has been for a while that these ideas are no longer as existent in the physical space as they are in the virtual space. That Twitter and Reddit and places like Twitter and Reddit, be that Quora, be that Pinterest, are becoming the actual hotspots for agglomeration economies. Parallelly, I was also smitten by an idea that coronavirus in some sense is the future, is in some sense the catalyst of the future. The idea generally being that there were so many potential artifacts, there were so many potential changes that we had envisaged, that we had prepared for. There were so many projected nightmares that we had envisaged and sort of prepared for, but they had not manifested up until. And one good example of that is the VR technology. Like we were making extremely sophisticated virtual reality technology, but it was just not being acquired by the masses. It was not being accepted by the masses. It was not being adopted by the masses. And so it was not the most fancy capitalist product in the market up until. But with the coronavirus coming in and all of us being forced to acknowledge our virtual realities more so than ever, my bet was that the, the agglomeration economies are entirely, or at least majorly, going to get absorbed in the virtual spaces. And that is precisely why I got myself on Twitter in the first place. I know it sounds weird, you know? I know it sounds weird that I got on Twitter in 2020 when most people are sort of shouting for the decline of Twitter, when, when Twitter has become so saturated that the company has to step in and instantiate fact-checking mechanisms and such. And I understand that that is the case, but consider Twitter a placeholder. Consider Twitter a placeholder for a decentralized public texting information and news platform. And that, I feel, will come to embody the agglomeration economies of the future. The guest I had for today is Vizakan Virswami. Vizakan Virswami is a Tamil-born Singaporean a very, very interesting person. Somebody who I think takes Twitter far more seriously than most people I meet. And that is how I came to be acquainted with Visa. That's how people popularly call 
Visa Akin is Visa. That's how I came to be acquainted with Visa. I found him on Twitter and I was absolutely stunned by the kind of writing that he does. And his writing, uh, much unlike most of the polished, professional, opinionated, or just rogue, rebellious writing that I find on Twitter, his writing has a sense of personality, has a sense of vulnerability, has a sense of awareness, has a sense of an acknowledgement of his own limitations that makes him very endearing to the people who, who subscribe to him and who follow him on, on Twitter. Visa has managed to um, take Twitter seriously enough to use it to his massive advantage. And this conversation reveals how, how Visa has done that, but it is sort of phenomenal that he's built his own extremely strong network within an extremely large saturated network, right? It was Visa's birthday, I think a few days before this podcast went live. Um, and it was phenomenal watching Visa's friends, Visa, Visa's Twitter friends offering to buy people. Visa's book, the, fr the book's called Friendly Ambitious Nerd, by the way, I'll attach the link in the comments. But it was very endearing to see that he's actually found a community. A community of people he can call friends and pe people who can call him a friend through Twitter. And it's not just that, but it's also the fact that Visa took Twitter seriously in the sense where he he adopted this, this journaling kind of a, what he, what he called a thousand word vomit, which is essentially where he would just write about things that were relevant and important to him in a very meta aware kind of a fashion where it wasn't the, the purpose of writing was not to express an opinion and get to a conclusion, but to get as far as he could with the resources, with the thinking tools, with the data that Visa had. And in doing that, he's managed to bring out a very unique vulnerability that all of us share, but are too shy of confessing. And I think that is what brings people closer to Visa. And so in this conversation, what I was inquiring with Visa was, is there any merit to thinking that you can find a proper community of people, that you can create a proper home space in the virtual world? You see, I have been frustrated by the idea that we think that Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, the virtual world in some sense is like an adjunct, is like an addition, an accessory to the physical world. I think now, undeniably so, that the virtual world exists unto itself as a standalone universe and that it has its own rules and its own principles and its own ways of functioning and that we can no longer treat that to just be, you know, like the real world's ugly cousin. It, 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 it has sort of acquired the dimension of being a world unto itself. And so that is the journey I set out with Visa on. I was, I was trying to inquire if there is any merit to looking at the virtual world as a standalone object, if there is any merit to thinking that you could find a home, that you could create your own space, that you could actually take Twitter more seriously than the political commentators and the presidents and the prime ministers of the world do. And in that weirdness, we came to some of the most fantastic points that I've ever come to in, in, in a conversation for my podcast. I mean, anybody who's followed me long enough understands that I have such a taste for bouncing across my ideas against the very interesting people that I end up meeting. But in this conversation, particularly, I just stepped back and I sat down because Visa and his, the way he thinks and the way he talks blew my mind. And I'm sure it'll be the same with you. So without much ado, let's get on the conversation. Um, taking Twitter seriously with Vizak and Veeraswamy. Welcome. Thank you so much for doing this, Visa. You are uh, one badass person. If you can just smoke a cigarette as we switch on a podcast, I have respect for that. Um, how's uh, how's life in Singapore, man? What is it that you what is it that you're drinking when we talk? Oh, this is uh, Carlsberg <laughs> beer. It's just oh, some okay. beer that I had in the fridge. All right. Uh, uh, I mean, so we are also you know COVID is here as well, and we have. Uh, we just supposedly reduced our, so we called it, we call our lockdown a circuit breaker. I uh -huh. think that's just the name they call it. And uh, so the, when they started it in like March, I think they said that it was going to go into like a lesser lockdown in June. So now we're kind of, we are supposedly allowed to visit family, but there's restrictions. So you can't, so like yesterday I went to see my in-laws. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, you know, you still can't eat out so that it still, it, it still feels like lockdown. Basically people are still wearing masks and it's all, but it's all right. You know, it doesn't really affect me that right. much. I do miss my friends, but you know, it's right. all right. 
Right. You know, what's interesting to me is that I was, um, so just so that people have a, a little more context, because I usually provide the description for who I'm talking to. I give an introduction so people have an idea why I'm talking to this person, but you um, have a very unique presence. And I'm going to stop at unique because the word's ambiguous enough for us to dig into and actually find out what this uniqueness is made out of on Twitter. So I was surfing through your Twitter yesterday and there was right. something about, um, an acknowledgement of the fact that Singapore in some sense had not lived up to its, its expectation in terms of handling with the handling the, the virus situation vis-a-vis -vis migrant workers. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and to me and to not, not just me, but to somebody who studies economics and Singapore is cited as the, like the model of development in so many senses, right. Where it's like mm -hmm. from the outside, it looks like Singapore has got it figured out in so many ways. I'm curious, what is this dissonance? What, what is really happening? Why are there two separate, you know, pictures that I'm getting from the inside and the outside? I guess it depends on your frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So the thing you have to understand about Singapore is that, again, so, and, and it's always slightly awkward to talk about these things because Singapore is where I was born and raised and spent the vast majority of my life. So it is my primary frame of reference. So I'm used to things, I take for granted things that Singaporeans take for granted, which is that we expect everything to just work. We expect, you know, and, how lucky, and I mean, how lucky. <laughs> the, 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 the thing is there are, there are trade-offs. Right, so, you right, know, we, course, people yes. will say it, Singapore is, is a, it is a very strict country. You know, we have drug laws, we have, there's, there's, there's pros and cons and um, people don't, re if they've only ever lived in Singapore, they don't really have context for what they are missing out on, for example. And also, um, and I'm thinking now about how when I visited San Francisco last year, I was kind of um, astounded slash shocked. Well, I mean, I, I was told to expect it, so it wasn't a complete shock. But like the uh, trains, the, the Bay Area rapid, but the but mm -hmm. it's just to a Singaporean, it just seems like unconscionably poorly run. Like it's just, it looks, it's like. I mean, it's it's like one of the California is, itself is one of the richest would be one of the richest countries in the world if it was a country. Mm -hmm. But you know, the the culture is different, and you know they have more of a car culture, I guess, and they don't prioritize public transport and public works and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so you were asking about migrant workers, yeah. Um, so Singapore has Singapore is built by migrant workers basically, right, from the very beginning, from from even before independence. And again, we are probably not the worst in the world at it. You know, there's other countries that have even more terrible, uh, migrant, migrant worker, worker situations. Uh, yes. And, yeah. I acknowledge. But you know, that like, it's, I mean, you can get a bit, you can get kind of philosophical about it. It's like, whatever your conditions are in life as an individual, let's say, right. Like, um, you know, you will always be sensitive to what you are doing wrong or what is not working out for you. So, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, I was stressed about, will anybody ever hire me? Will I ever get a job? Will I ever have an audience? Right. And then I started work and I got, I got like one of my, I got a dream job of, or, you know, like a job that was beyond my wildest dreams. It was, it was a great work environment. It was, you know, I respected my boss. I, the, the work I was doing was interesting and fun. And I remember at some point I was like stressed about work. I was like upset like because I was struggling with some content that I was trying to produce. And I remember thinking to myself, like I was feeling sorry for myself. I was like, oh my God, fuck my life. Like uh, this work is so difficult. And then I got like whiplash. Like what the fuck? Like why? Like a year ago, like I would have been extremely happy to have the job that I have now. Right. But like, once you get it, you know, you, you start to take for granted all of the good things and then you start to notice all of the bad things. Mm. And you know, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing because there's always room for improvement. There's always, you know, so, so it is with, I guess, like our I migrant worker you. situation. I and you, you know, it's, it's easy for, for a citizen to say, Oh, you know, our migrant worker problem is not that bad. Or, right. or right. Like I, like it's, I'm not the one living in the, in the dorms that are overcrowded and, and, you know, and, and you will hear from, you know, everyday Singaporeans saying things like, Oh, but you know, the migrant workers, they made a choice to come here and, you know, they're doing it because working here is 
better than trying to make it back home. And right. when they save up money here and they move back, they're going to have a higher standard of living. That's true. But also, you know, it's like, should it, there's, there's the sense of what is the social contract in the city that you live where right. if, if the average citizen is relatively so prosperous compared to most of the world, then, you know, is it, is it fair that, you know, we are paying them what we are paying them? Is it, you know, we, we say things like, oh, market forces, right? But it's, it's still, there are still, the disparity is still visible. And, mm. and you know, I, I think it's something that we have to think about. And right. so we want to work on it. And we just, we always want to have a better, like we can always be better. And so we should always be trying to be better. Mm-hmm. Hmm, right. I think uh, one of the most interesting things that I read off Twitter while the whole coronavirus narrative became the focus of Twitter, which I will admit now is no longer the case, um, was the, the true legacy of coronavirus is not work from home, it's class consciousness. And, and, and part, of it, hmm. part of it resonated with me in the sense where for the first time ever, the haves and the have nots had the clearest, most undeniable life and death distinction as far as migrant yeah. workers in India were concerned, right? And I'm not sure yeah. how much you kept up with that, but it was pretty I'm horrible, familiar. right? Yeah. Uh, but you know what you mentioned was super interesting to me, this acquisition of a, this, this re- reacquiring a baseline over and over. I keep ad- adjusting and adapting to a new baseline. It's called hedonic adapting, uh, hedonic yeah. adaptation, right? And I wonder, right. with, with because here is the deal, when I sit, sit across from a friend of mine who's born and brought up in China, and right. when I sit across from a friend of mine who's born and brought up in America, two of the most, let's say, polar opposite concepts of freedom in some sense, I realize both of them function pretty fine. In fact, right. they might prefer some things that the, either the, the, op- the other person does not prefer about them. So like my Chinese friend might prefer the fact that XYZ ABC, which my American friend would not like in my Chinese friend. The general idea being, including the trade-offs, the net balance of living in Singapore, is that something you you'd be like, you know, like I remember you could not you cannot have you cannot throw chewing gums or chew chewing gums in in Singapore as far as the law. Uh, so it's it's illegal to sell it. So there's you can't buy it anywhere in Singapore itself. But like uh, if you buy it in Malaysia, let's say you buy like enough for personal consumption, you can bring it into Singapore right. and and that. So it's not. I mean, I find that the the international reporting on that tends to be a bit alarmist. Like they right. make it out to be way crazier than it actually is. Mm-hmm. But it is a thing. Like there's there's restrictions. So these these aggressive laws in whichever direction, innocuous or not, that exist, plus this marvelous efficiency and scale of doing things. Is that a net trade off you're happy with, or is that a net trade off you'd be like? Because I can imagine an American being like, you know what? I care about my freedom more. You see what I mean? What do you what do you think about right. Singapore as a, as a net? I mean, so it's funny that we're talking about this right now because right now there's widespread protests in the states and there's right. curfews, and <laughs> you know that it's, we we don't have that in Singapore. So, right, right. But you know, it it would be almost too easy for me to say, "Aha, look, this is how Singapore is better than the states." Mm-hmm. Like you know, and and you know, having so being Singaporean and participating in the international community, you get every every year or so you you get a new article in the American media or whatever about oh Singapore is so sterile, it's so authoritarian. You know they have this like we are like this bogeyman in a way mm, for them, mm, mm. and so it's very very tempting to to fight back and to strike back and say you know what like you know we're doing fine and you guys are suffering so you know who's really up and down right but at the same time there are other variables to consider so i think i think the biggest variable that people of almost always underestimate is literally size so singapore is a very small it's an island city state Hmm. but it's a whole country is a city and it's a state it's a small thing so we don't have you know um like city government and then federal government. It's all the same government. And and that is easier to manage in a lot of ways. And there are also certain things that other people who live in bigger countries may not appreciate. So, mm. you know, every Singaporean male does national service, which is either you serve in the military or the police or the civil defense, which is, you know, fire engine and all that stuff. And, you know, as a Singaporean me i'm 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 proud to have served and uh not i mean so you will get different opinions from people about that whether or not it's it's acceptable right, right. but right. like you know that's the case uh, for israel as well like israel Korean, yeah, yeah. all of them have an opinion but they do it regardless 
That's true. Yeah. And I mean, you can't really not do it by choice. I right. mean, I, I think in Israel, you can be a dissenter and then you go to you prison. You can be religious. Instead. You can be religious. And yeah. There's, be. there's a, yeah. But then I think there's, there's still, you still have to spend time in, in something. I'm not sure about the specifics, but so that is a big difference between large countries and small ones. Mm -hmm. And I having, you know, having my sense of perspective, I feel that it's probably healthier to live in a smaller country. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you, if you look at like very large countries like China, America, India, and then you look at smaller countries in, in Europe or uh, in, you know, I guess mainly I'm thinking of Europe. I'm not so and sure. And East Asia, it. East Asia, like, you know, South Korea is one example. Yeah, I, I, I Korea, can't, Singapore, yeah. I so, yeah. Yeah. So there are things about living in a large country where, and especially if it's a, if it's not a homogenous country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, China is a bit more homogenous, although even then, if you get into the details there, there's, there's like some details about how they manage their minorities in the situation right. there, which I, I, I'm not qualified to talk about that, but it's right. messy and <laughs> ugly. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> Indonesia is another very large country that has, I mean, so I, knowing what I know, I think I would prefer to be a citizen of a small country. Hmm. I think it gives you a more grounded perspective on life even, hmm. uh, which isn't to say that you can't be grounded living in a large country, but I think being in a large country and seeing what's happening in politics in the States and I think politics in India as well. Hmm. I think there's something about like, when, so when the, when the country is so large, um, you, you don't really know what's going on at the other part of the country. Right? So Singapore hmm. is so small. You can, you can walk, you can walk across the country in a day. Like you, hmm. you can survey the whole country. You, you basically know everyone like, hmm. you know, so even when people say things like Singapore is so authoritarian, it's like, yeah, but you have to understand that it's like, we all have friends in government. We all have friends in, in all of the ministries, you know, it's not disconnected. It's not some federal government, hmm. like thousands of miles away. And so it's a lot more intimate. And again, I think that's healthier. Just imagine like working in a small company of like 10, 20 people versus working in a company with right. like 5,000 people. It's, it's a different relationship. Right. Some people prefer that in the large country, in the large company, it's more anonymous. You don't really need to like know what's going on. You can kind of like, ignore stuff and everything's fine and some right. people prefer that right uh, i have a bias for preferring a small country where you know so if i feel that there's something not right in singapore i can have a pretty high confidence of being able to i could write a blog post potentially or whatever i could i can get a message out to most of the rest of my country in, a, in like a, in a fairly short amount of time hmm. which is a, which, which gives me a sense of belonging a sense hmm. of participation which I sense that a lot of my American friends and I think quite a lot of my Indian friends as well, they, they respective, they don't feel like they have that. It's mm -hmm. like, like your, your political opponents or like the other tribe is like this way. It's almost like this, this phantom hallucination right. kind of thing. And right. so the media has much more influence in controlling the narrative right. and in election bias and all those things. I think there's this, there's this uh, TED talk by Benjamin Barber, if I'm getting his name right. Mm -hmm. He argues that you know, nation states, so there used to be empires, right? And empires are no longer a thing because just the, after World War One and Two, there was the, whatever agreements, the treaties that were signed and just everyone just came around to saying empires don't make sense. Nation states make more sense. And the argument is that, you know, nation states too are kind of like a, like an interim solution. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's like an in-between state. Exactly. And the one thing that, and the, the argument is that, but cities, cities have endured for thousands of years, you know, regardless of what empire comes in or goes out, you know, who's the conqueror, who's the king, mm. whether the one, at one point there's a Roman empire, one point that's not, but the city of Milan, the city mm. of Pisa, the city of Delhi, right? Wow. These cities have histories and they have, they have culture and, and whatever. And it's, it's more natural for humans to, to be involved in that local kind of sphere. Right. And so in, in that kind of grand scheme, scheme of things, I think city states are healthier than, and, but again, I, when I say that, I wonder if, you know, I'm speaking from a point of view of like, based on my history, right. Which is right. during my lifetime, during my lifetime, there hasn't been a world war. Mm -hmm. Right. And when there is a world war, like, you know, you don't want to be some a small, small city. city when there right. is an empire at your doorstep. Right. right. So that's, 
that's when things can be terrible. So it's very conditional. It's very contextual. But, but you know, I, I think you you are onto something with the idea that the nation state concept is battling more than one problem at once, right? It is battling a problem yeah. with the outside world, and it is battling a problem with the inside world, and that equilibrium is extremely difficult to find. And I and therefore, I mean, it's almost it's almost kind of instinctively weird to me when people begin to say, quote unquote, rate countries, is Singapore better than America? Because you have to understand right. that on a two dimensional graph, they are two different points of equilibrium. Right, it's not like they could be represented on a linear scale. I'm not even sure if a two two way graph would do justice to representing the kind of variables that must be represented in a question like that. And yeah. I think this the this the the whole commentary you brought up about how intimate your community, Singapore as a country, can be. The idea is so foreign to me from <laughs> coming yeah. from India, just Im- immensely foreign to me. And th- th- I don't know. Do you follow Nasim Taleb? or yep. Joe Norman, have you been listening to their commentary on uh, localism? Does that resonate with the kind of model that Singapore already organically sort of has? Yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with Caleb's work and I've seen what he's written about Singapore. And so he points out that even, so Singapore's closest neighbor is Malaysia, which is just north of Singapore. Right. And he points out that even Singapore and Malaysia, even though they're neighbors, you can't really compare them because Malaysia has like, 50 cities, 100 cities. I'm not even sure how many cities. It has mm-hmm. like 14 states, I think, or 16. Mm-hmm. And they have different cities. So it, it, it probably is the case that um, Singapore should be thought of, thought of as a city. Mm. And cities, you can, com- you can compare cities to other cities. So what's it like in Singapore versus mm-hmm. Delhi versus London versus uh, right. New York versus San Francisco? So each city has its own set of um, values and, and principles and whatnot. Uh, and so with having said all of that preamble, the core question that you're asking was, uh, do I think Singapore's trade-offs are, are, are you know, kind of good? Um, so, you know, I, I love my country, but I'm not satisfied with it. I think we have a lot of, I, I think we've come a very long way. I think we made the best of what we inherited. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, so like, Singapore and Singapore and you know even between cities there are many different kinds of cities and you know there are like very very old cities that have a ton of history and and uh, so Singapore I would I would describe Singapore as a maritime city and what I mean by that is is a sit a city with travel and trade that is deeply intertwined with the country's history and the pop so it's a it's an immigrant population right which isn't true for every single city in the world mm. like some cities have. I think, uh, so Taylor has talked about how like, some of the Mediterranean countries, the people in the Levant or whatever, they've been there for thousands of years, right? Mm-hmm. And their culture is that old. And Singapore doesn't have that. I mean, so the, the, what I, and you know, this is one of the things that I am personally passionate about. I feel like Singapore as a, as a concept, as an idea, uh, we have changed our national concept a few times in mm-hmm. the past couple of hundred years. And, you know, um, when after independence, after separation from Malaysia in 1965, there was this narrative of kind of um, fragility and, and like, you know, we, we don't have an army. We just got kicked out of a bigger country. We're not going to survive. We need to be des- desperate times, desperate measures. We have to really kind of, you know, we don't have, we don't have a history. We have to build everything from scratch. And mm. that worked out for like 50 years. And, but I think the, the value of that narrative, so I think that narrative was kind of, um, it was deliberately constructed for that purpose of kind of building the nation in, in that short period of time in like an emergency context. Right. But it doesn't, have, it doesn't have like lasting power over centuries, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the kind of troubling things if you study city-states, you know, um, Venice and, and all of those countries, is that city-states don't tend to last more than a couple of hundred years or so. Like, it's just, it's, historically, it doesn't quite mm-hmm. work out that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, in that it's a country. And um, I think for Singapore's ongoing um, future, I think we have to dig deeper into kind of what, what the story of the country is, and we have to redefine that for ourselves. And how I'm approaching it is that, you know, again, like so Singapore has been around. So the island has been around forever, obviously. And it has, if you go, if you dig back into 400, 800 years of, his, of history, it was once a part of like the Indonesian, um, like like maritime empires. It was part of the Sri Vijaya Empire. It's part of the Mahap, Majapahit. 
Majapahit Empire, and it was you know it's it was just a a, a valuable trading port in a maritime space and right. and that changes who's in charge who's the king that changes from time to time but the point is that there are always merchants and travelers coming by on ships so now we have you know it's the year 2020 and we have planes well right now there are no planes flying because of right. covid but you know we we are we are in this very interesting position in southeast asia between india and china and i believe that well okay what i haven't said yet is i think a city should have a story i think you know, it should have economic opportunity and it should have a narrative that, that the people of the city believe in. Hmm. And I feel like the Singaporean narrative has been great for us up until around now, but it won't continue to last. So we need, we need a more robust narrative. Evoca- yeah, a more evocative narrative that people believe in. Because again, 50 years ago, it was like, we have nothing. And if we work really hard, we'll have something. That was enough. Have something. And then they... Yeah. So now we have something, yeah. but we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not like happy. You know, we're, we're kind of like, we're kind of like, it's, it's like the, the, the analogy I've given some people is imagine your, imagine Singapore is like this, this kid, this nerdy kid that gets bullied in school, right? World right. War II, right? You get occupied by foreign invaders. So, you know, this nerdy kid gets beaten up, pissed on. And then he's like, you know what? Like, I'm going to, I'm going to work out. I'm going to hmm. study hard. I'm going to do a hundred pushups every day. I'm not going to have any fun at all. I'm just going to focus on my grades, study really hard, get a good job, get, make a lot of money. And so, yeah, now you've got your good job. You make a lot of money. You're like fit. You're, everything seems great, but you're not happy. You're like, okay, now what? Like you mm-hmm. didn't have time to figure out what your culture is. You didn't have time mm-hmm. to figure out what, what your, your, what, what's meaningful to you. It was just mm-hmm. getting away from like, hor- like this, Stress, and, right, right. Yeah, and so right. now, so now we, so like you know, our parents' generation struggled to give us the, the, the breathing room to breathe, but they couldn't tell us what we should be dreaming about, right? Mm. And and dreaming was a luxury that we couldn't afford at the time. Right. But now that we're here, it's like you know, people are you know that people are increasingly getting kind of depressed, despondent, kind mm. of you know, what is it all for? I'm working so hard, I'm making so much money, I got a nice car, a nice handbag, but. So what, you know, like what, then what's next? And I think what's exciting is that we are seeing, you know, the rise of India and the rise of China and really a resurgence of Asian uh, influence, power, how are we going to put it? Just, just those billions of people are rising in the world, right? And I feel like Singapore is a very interesting uh, place to... So I I guess the question I want to answer is what would make an ambitious, smart, courage like just a, just think of like really great people like re- just all around great smart kind just wonderful people what would make them want to come to singapore and and set up their life here like they can go anywhere they want if they want to go to new york they can go to new york if they want to go to san francisco london moscow wherever they, tokyo wherever they want to go they can go what would make them want to come to singapore and and i think that's a question that we need to answer i think we haven't had a good answer in a while it used even now the narrative is like oh singapore is very safe it's a very safe place to raise your kids mm-hmm. like that's not fun you know that's, right. that's not exciting that's like what like it's like a that's retirement like a plan yeah that's like a yeah, backup it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's not sexy you know it's not if people people almost apologize when they when they talk about Singapore, they're like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, it's not a lot of fun. It's kind of, right. but it's safe. You know, the food is good. Mm-hmm. But like, I want to be able to be like, yo, dude, if you, you got to come to Singapore, man, this is where the future mm. is happening, right? right. Like this, it's, it's where the culture is going to happen. You know, it's where we are. East meets West. You know, there's, right. there's, you'll see there's Americans here. There's Chinese people here. You can, Indians here. And like, right. this is where the best people from the best parts of the world are all gathering here to figure out what the future is. But like, right. I think that's exciting. That's a cool narrative that we, you wake up in the morning and like, oh, I can't wait to go out and meet these people and see what they're doing. That's right. that's exciting. That's what life should be, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think Singapore does have... So it's we're not there yet. There's a bunch of stuff we need to change and fix. Like, you know, some of the old laws are way too... Like, yeah, it was for a different time. It was, we were, you know, we were recovering from war. We were dealing with communism and whatnot. And, you know, we we need more arts. We need more culture. We need more... Like, just all of those things. We, we, we can do more, but people need... Uh, leadership people need 
other people to look to for guidance and, and they need to see people doing crazy, exciting things. And then I think more and more people will come. And that's, a, right. that's one of my major life goals, I guess. It's like to make Singapore great, great. again. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, uh, the way I frame it is we've, we've never had like an, like an intellectual slash cultural golden age. Right. We, we had an economic boom. But the economic boom was at the expense of culture in a way. Mm-hmm. Like we didn't have, like there's, you know, nobody really says Singaporean artists, Singaporean poets. You know, now you will hear some people say there's a Singaporean guy on Twitter. There's one guy, right? Yeah, right, but right. I wanna, right. But I want to find all the other cool people and bring them together and, you know, put on a show and, and make people right. excited. And Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't know up until if I was doing injustice to the fact that I was dragging you through a conversation about Singapore when I should... Ideally, which when I genuinely have more interesting stuff to dig into, but now that I realize there is so few, um, let's say, voices from Singapore as loud since, you know, now that I have more context in it, I see that I've made my choices in the correct order. I'm not, I'm not regretful. Right. right. But I, uh, you know what I found very interesting because I, I, at this point I realized like, you know, um, I mean, I was just listening to you describe Singapore and let's call right. that to be an attempt to make a unified theory of Singapore or of the continuation <laughs> right. of the, right. And you use sure. some terms, um, you use nerd, you used ambitious, and those are both terms you've sort of used to describe in some sense yourself when you wrote the book, Friendly yeah. Ambitious Nerd, right? And I'm yeah. wondering if there is, if there is some sort of a parallel in the unified theory of visa and the unified theory yeah. of Singapore. There is, there is, there is. It's, uh, I mean, and you know, so I would say that friendly, ambitious nerd is my unified theory of human excellence. Mm-hmm. Like, so again, like you can go, you can go and if, solid, one of my, right. So one right. of my things is just when, and one of the, it's slightly crazy, slightly terrifying, slightly um, exciting is to look at history and realize that it's not, you know, some people think history used to be shit and then it slowly gets better, slowly gets better. It's not like that. It's like, it's crazy wild up and downs. And sometimes cities have like a golden age where for for 200 years, they flourish like crazy. It's a ton of art. There's a ton, there's like scientific advancement. There's, there's music, culture, you know, in, in India's golden age, they invent zero, right? They invent, mm-hmm. and in Baghdad's golden age, they invent chemistry. You know, they, they really, the, the human species has been advanced in such, it's not, it's not really a slow, steady thing. It's not gradual. Like, it's not yeah, gradual. It's, it's called very, punctuated it's, equilibria. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah, right. It's, right. it's super spiky. And like, it's amazing how, how much greatness in the world like, so I, I'm careful not to fall into the trap of like doing like a, like a great man theory kind of thing where, oh, one person is responsible for everything. Uh-huh. But like, but, and in fact, when you study it, you will always find that anytime you see someone described as a great man, like whether it's Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, like Lee Kuan Yew, whoever it is that people say, oh, this one person did amazing things. You will find that they had like a team around them or like a scene around them where, you know, so Steve Jobs used to go to the homebrew computing club and the homebrew computing club even was like 10 years after I think uh, the Manhattan project. And, you know, there's just, there's this context where, extremely talented people were working on very difficult problems in roughly the same area. And then they all converge and they socialize and on the weekends or whatever for fun, they showed off their computers to each other. And now we have iPhones, right? And same in like in Japan after world war two, there were like people who were doing radio repairs and then whatnot. And like a bunch of nerds got together, they formed Sony and then they have, you know, have the Walkman, the PlayStation, like it's amazing how, so much human pro and that's that's like sciencey product stuff. That's the same thing in, in music and culture. You know, you look at the history of jazz, it's like 50 people. It's a very small group of people who incubate something that the whole world can then enjoy. And uh, once I once I became aware of this, like I'm wondering why isn't why am I not in one right now? Like mm-hmm. and if, if I'm not, how do I make it happen? How do I be embedded in a scene of 50 to 100 people who are making the future who are making things that are amazing you can and you can really you can look it up it's like you know when when tolkien was writing law of the rings he was friends with c.s lewis and who was writing you know narnia like it always like once you go looking for it you realize it's greatness never happens by itself it's always right. people trying to one-up each other and impress each other and so what that means is that if you can find ambitious people and very often people you know they start out ambitious and if they have if if they try to do whatever it is they want to do 
And if there's no feedback from the world, there's no response, then they give up because it's like, what's the point of doing the thing if no one appreciates my work? So you need at least one other person who appreciates the work. And whether mm. it's, it's physics and people are trying to split the atom or, you know, um, I think like poets trying to reinvent poetry in, in England, like it, it always boils down to a small group of people trying to impress each other. And, you know, they are, they are nerdy. When I say they're nerdy, I mean that they care very much about the specifics of what is possible and they're curious about something. They pursue their curiosity to figure out why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? What if we tried something else? And then they're ambitious in that they want, you know, they don't, they don't just want to know like, like, oh, I guess you can, you know, like, so with, with painters or whatever, they're like, can, or sculptors, like, like, how far can we push marble? And then they're like, you know, how do we, you know, can we make something? I mean, there's a whole ecosystem. So you need the, the investors, the patrons, whatever, but like people all coming together to create this culture of let's build the most beautiful and amazing buildings that will last for centuries that, you know, our great, great grandchildren will be like, how did they do that? That's amazing. I don't understand. Mm. You know, like they want to do that. And to do that, you have to collaborate with other people. So you have to be friendly. So that's like, that's that, that kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that Trinity, if you have all of that and you interface with other people like that, then like the, the, even the casual conversations you have with each other will push each other to be more yeah. ambitious, to try bigger things. And yeah, and I feel like one of my core theses is that the internet allows this and people don't seem to realize just how much it enables it. Mm -hmm. And the analogy I use is that, you know, the electric guitar was invented in about 1930. Mm -hmm. What they did was they basically, they basically wanted the acoustic guitar to be able to play to a larger audience. And so they wanted to amplify it. And so they put a pickup and then it makes a louder sound. And for like 20 years, 25 years, electric guitars were played exactly like acoustic guitars. It's just the same simple chords and whatever. And then, you know, in like, in like 30 years after the invention of the, of the acoustic guitar came Jimi Hendrix and Hendrix right. freaking pushed it to its limit. He turned right. up the, the overdrive. He pressed the wah wah. He, right. he made it, it made it seem like an alien instrument. Yeah. He even the used the is, feedback. He used the feedback yeah, to yeah. make the sound. Right. Like, exactly. So the thing, the, the, the crazy thing is everything that Hendrix did, there was no reason why it couldn't have been done in 1933 or 34, you know, but it took 30 years for someone to try something new with that crazy new um, device that just previously everyone was using it to copy what was being done before. And he was the first guy or, you know, one of the first few guys and the one who succeeded and asking, what can we do with this that nobody was doing before? Right. And I feel like something similar is true for the internet and for social media. It's kind of, it's kind of my, my, like my grand hype. I mean, I don't want to say grand, but it's like, it's a belief I have that most people don't seem to share. Like, uh, it's, it's kind of scary. It's kind of, I could be wrong. Like statistically, I'm like, probabilistically I'm most likely wrong, mm -hmm. but if I'm right, the payoff on that is so massive right. that, I have to do it. I have to, even if I'm like, if there's like a 1% chance that I'm right, like I have to take it because if it works out, we will have a new golden age of humanity. Like, so I what mean, is I, it? I'm, I'm what is this? Steps. No, no, no. I get that. And th th that's fine. You know, when you paint a dream, you, I don't expect anybody to be practical, but I'm very curious as to what it is. Like, what is this? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Right. So think about, think about every great mind throughout human history. Think about, you know, um, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Voltaire and people who were communicating with each other, mostly at the time by letters mm -hmm. and, and how slow that mode of communication was. They had to wait days to get a response and they would write letters. It just that like, you know, the, the rate at which humanity can advance is kind of dependent on the quality of conversations that high high level players are having. So golden ages happen when you have a high concentration of very smart people of, you know, whether it's scientists, philosophers, musicians, like they're all concentrated in one place and right. they're challenging each other. And so far in history, that has almost been an accident of history or, you know, like, like people wouldn't even have known, like the information could not spread that, you know, like it could be that you live in Milan and you are a pretty good painter, but you just don't know that in Florence, there's a freaking Renaissance happening where if you had gone to Florence, like you would be hanging out with all these other painters and you would have been on the same level as Da Vinci maybe, but right. you might not have known because no one's talking about it around you. You just by accident, by luck, or, you know, like that right. didn't happen. 
Right. But now, now we have the opportunity, we have like the greatest communication devices in the history of humanity. But like, uh, you know, the, and again, like when I talk to people about this, they're like, oh, but you know, don't we have like TED and Reddit and Quora and like that? There, there are all these channels. But my experience on these channels is that very few people ever give their maximum effort. Hmm. Because they don't think it will be appreciated. Because hmm. if you put in the effort to really do something substantial, most of the audience is like passers by and just random people. They're not going to really appreciate the work that you put in. And so a lot of people don't even try. And so what's happening is there are a bunch of geniuses, I believe. And when I say genius, you know, I don't mean that people are born geniuses. I think people are born with potential and then they have to, the genius has to be like hammered. You know, it's like a sword. You have to, you have to make it happen. And like all these potential geniuses are kind of goofing off because they don't really, they, they can't identify each other. They don't see, they, they, they look around and they see other people who are also goofing off. So everyone's just goofing off and they don't realize that, you know, if 10 of us come together, we can change the world. Like it, right. it's still true. It was true. And, you know, Steve Jobs and friends did it to make Apple. Right. And it's true and found Facebook. That, that has not changed. That remains true every day. And it feels a bit silly to say it, at eight, you know, maybe like 21 year old guys, 20 year old guys, they say it to sound cool over beer or whatever, but then they get a job and then they reach 25, 26, they need to get married, they have bills to pay. And then they're like, ah, oh, you know, I don't have time for this shit. I'm going to, mm. you know, I'm going to play video games or go, go to the bar or whatever. Like they, they lose their idealism too early. But like, if you commit to like 50 years, like the output that you do, over, and if you look at any, anybody truly great, like all the great painters and stuff, they, they have like a life's work that, it could be that for the first 30 years, you're mediocre. And then like in the last 50 years, you're... Insane. It's likely. It's likely that that right? would be the case, right? But most people don't make it through the early stages. And so they think they can't dance. They think they can't write. They can't paint, whatever. It's super tragic. School disincentivizes this, which is crazy. So if, if you look back, so many of the geniuses, they're like, they almost fall through the cracks. Like right. Da Vinci was like self-directed and, and you know... Yeah, anyway. Um, so my, I, I have a sharper question to ask with respect to that. And my question right. is, when you said the payoff, because probabilistically I might be wrong, but if I'm not, the payoff is extremely high. I'm trying to understand what is this marginal competitive factoid that you figured out. And I mean, I'm trying to get at what we had spoken about earlier. I think you take Twitter and Twitter particularly, but the internet as a whole, seriously in a way, and then therefore right. Twitter takes you seriously in a way that is extremely novel. And yeah. what I think that is, I mean, I take Twitter more seriously because I follow you, not because your views are like, it's <laughs> no, 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 not because you're, because I, I, you were doing this very weird kind of a meta aware tweeting where it's like, you were sort of like, it's, it's kind of like a stream of consciousness. I don't really know what to describe it, but right now to me, when somebody's like, dude, why are you on Twitter? It's such a shit show. I'm like, you just haven't explored Twitter properly. I have this yeah. guy. I know his name's visa. You should check him out. List reading what he's written is, is this halfway point between a diary entry and a text message to a friend. And it's so meta aware that it's not even hardcore. So his opinions are more like, I'm more happy to incorporate his. I'm not sure how to describe you. Right, I'm not sure how to describe this phenomena. How would you do that? How would I describe myself? Yeah, so again, <laughs> I, I, I was I was mentioning like you know Ben Franklin and so on. So those guys are my heroes. You know, I feel like, uh, and you know, I say guys because at the time there weren't women didn't have much. Uh, it's not that. So you know, right now my contemporary heroes there are a lot of women as well. But like, the, so the point is that um, like intellectuals who had friends that they could discuss philosophy with, discuss economics, science, whatever, they were advancing the state of human, uh, just the human, the light of human consciousness, they were pushing it forward. And they did it by talking to their friends, basically, right? And then they published books and treaties and, you know, but like before, and, and you know, you see all those philosophers, they wrote like this thick books about on on reason or you know like, ah, that's like, God, right, like, right, right. Like, like what who who would sit down and write a book called on reason for fun <laughs> it's not it's because it's because they were having conversations in the coffee shops with their friends and they were arguing with each other and they're like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna show you i'm gonna one up you. They, yeah right. and then they go and write that and so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to take that spirit of what i saw those guys doing hundreds of years, thousands of years ago even, and I'm trying to do it publicly 
assuming that if I do it, p- other people who are looking for that will see it eventually and, and they have at this point and then they will reciprocate and then we can start playing. So that's my... So I'm trying to bring back that kind of... Uh, <coughs> it's very... Uh, it's a very some people would say it's right. auto. Yeah, right. it's kind of a... Even I, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? right? Mm-hmm. Which is and and the the reason the voice sounds the way it does is because it's it's I I talk about things that I think are important, but I don't uh, I make it a point to be as casual as possible. I think I think that that combination is very rare. So normally people either are just having casual conversations about stuff that's not that important, or if they're having important conversations, it's like because they have their authority figures or you know they are they. In, from some institute or whatnot, so they have to be this very posh, very dramatic thing, and right. that, that's not not very inclusive. You know, the reason they talk like that is actually again, it's a historical vestige. It's like because back then you had, it's like you're in the king's court, and then you have to be like, oh, king, you know. We, <laughs> I, I, when when they discover the planets, they have to name it after. They have to say things like, uh, I remember one of the, I don't know if it was Galileo or someone. He's like, oh, uh-huh. Jupiter has has four moons and and Cosimo has four suns, and you know, so uh-huh. like clearly this this divine uh-huh. king is. You don't right. have to do that shit anymore, but people still do it. People still do a version of it because right. it's just old habits die hard, I guess. Appeal to mm-hmm. authority and stuff like that, but we don't have to do it. People don't realize that that like a lot of the again it's like the Hendrix thing again it's like I feel like we have all been given acoustic guitar uh, electric guitars and everyone's still playing like, like brilliantly like, said my friend that blows right? my mind before you finish the sentence no that's that's brilliantly said tell me tell me if this works because I am not you and therefore I do not have all the information on you but I think because I've been thinking I was like is would I describe Visa and would I say he's like the perfect online common person like you are not like you said you're not coming from a place of authority you're not but i think one way to describe it is uh, you know how jordan peterson got very famous in 2017 and he almost like reignited the concept of jungian archetypes and suddenly everybody believes in archetypes like they're their horoscopes right i feel like you are not living a story i think you are very authentically and i may be wrong but you are not everybody's trying to live out a story Right. And you'd find a bunch of these dudes picking up king, magician, lover, joker, something like there, there is all these archetypes that people ascribe to from they get it from the media architecture of things. They get it from Hollywood and Bollywood and all those kind of things. I think you are in some sense, at least on Twitter, not trying to live out a story. I think it is so undeniably authentic what you're doing that uh, it relates it you. And it's not just relate. Sometimes I'll see uh, people tweeting at you and it'll be like, it is so amazing to have spoken or like it is so amazing to have come in touch with some or some, some something about and, and it's like that conversation that is happening feels real like it does not feel like oh glad to make acquaintances you know it it almost really just like feels real so would you say there is any merit to this theoretical concept that visa is not trying to live out a story or is visa trying to live out a story uh i'm not sure uh <laughs> sounds like this it sounds plausible um, you know, so I don't have a specific archetype in mind. I mean, I, I try to look to people for inspiration, but I have like a lot of different people that I admire mm-hmm. who, you know, so I'm always curious about people who have, who brought things into the world that didn't exist before, you know, like kind of just whether it's, you know, inventing a country even, you know, so like a Nehru and Gandhi and, and Sun Yat-sen and Lee Kuan Yew, like, again, like, there was no country before and then you imagine a country and you, you make that happen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, I'm just trying to get as many interesting people together as possible. I think so once in a while I will run into somebody who doesn't like me and usually they, I, I understand why it's why? because they why? see I'm this. Curious. But, um, usually, because they think I'm a narcissist. Usually, they think I'm. I'm tr- they they think I'm trying to to build an audience to to kind of glorify myself. Uh-huh. Uh I I don't think that's true. I, and I've I've agonized about it myself. I've like you know I've sat alone. and I'm like, oh, am I just doing this like for for the likes or whatever? Mm-hmm. But like you know, so if you see what I did on Twitter today. The thing I did was I asked, so I have about 20,000 followers, which is more than most people have. Most people maybe have a few hundred, but it's not like celebrity, you right. know, celebrities have millions of followers, right? Mm-hmm. I have 20,000. It's not, it's not, sh- it's not crazy, but it's pretty substantial. And so what I did is I asked the people today, 
Okay, what cities are you guys from? Like, you know, tell me, reply to this tweet with what city you're in and I'll put it in a list. And then when anybody, any of my friends is traveling, they can be like, hey, I'm going to New York or I'm going to DC, who's there? And I can be like, hey, see, I have this list here and you can meet up with that person who's also interested in the kind of stuff I, I talk about. So mm-hmm. now you have, not, it's like I'm providing a public service in a way, right? Mm-hmm. I'm helping people connect, connect with other people. And I want to, I'm doing it for, the, the selfish thing is I want to see what they come up with. You know, right. I want to be, one of a frame I've recently used is I kind of want to be the Quincy Jones of Friendly Ambitious Nerds. And you know, mm-hmm. Quincy Jones is everywhere. It's like, if you look if you look at musical history, he was there with Frank Sinatra. He was there with Michael Jackson. He was with Miles Davis. Like wherever there were successful people, he was involved in some way. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> he discovered Oprah. It's like insane. But like, you know, he, he was it, was he doing it to glorify himself? I don't think so. I think he just, he loved music and he wanted to see the best possible musicians flourish in the best possible way. And everyone who works with him loves him. You know, he's just, he's this grand personality. Right. But yeah, so I... Here's an interesting idea. Here's an interesting idea. I was recently writing um, a paper about the future of New York City, right? Okay. And this was an economic geography paper, right? So this this refers to, this. this will also sort of opine on the idea as to what was happening in Milan and Florence and there was separation and whatnot. The general idea is that people are somehow attracted to places with other smart people yeah. because they understand that that means a better, better economic, cultural, social opportunity and whatnot. Right. Yeah. And that is the premise upon which New York city is built. New York city is not built on wall street. It's built on the right. fact that everybody from wall street climbs down, goes to the local Delhi, sits there, eats, tries to one up on each other, throw some ideas around and better stuff emerges. And that's why people yeah. are very willing to pay higher rents in New York city. My, exactly. doubt, my doubt is that uh, very soon we will all wake up. Because it, ha- it is not like it hasn't been happening already, but we will explicitly wake up to the fact that this concept is called agglomerations. That agglomeration economies now exist on Twitter, they exist on Reddit, they exist on YouTube, and they no longer need to exist in <coughs> New York City because I'm no longer tied to the physical space of my job with work. All of that stuff might start, start beginning. To- and parallelly, what I, what I understand from what you were doing is creating this... Um, Tighter network within the network, like a sub network of people and tightening them yeah. together, holding them together, creating an agglomeration of your own self, of your own self. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. from there, trying to explore something. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious, what is this something that you are trying to explore? So I am very agnostic as to the specifics, you know, so like, um, there's a quote that something like, uh, never be so obsessed with what you're looking for that you don't see what is there. And you know, it's like a lot of, a lot of inventions and discoveries. It's things that happen by accident. And you know, so like a stainless steel was invented when this guy in world war one, his job was to come up with like better gun barrels. And so he was experimenting with steel and like one of his experiments, which technically was a failed experiment because it wasn't helping what he wanted. The, he just noticed that the, the steel was super shiny. And then, but, and like, you know, he could have thrown it out as a failed experiment, but he had the, you know, sensitivity to realize that, hey, something interesting is happening here. I should, I should figure out what's going on. And that's, you know, it wasn't his job and it wasn't a part of what he was tasked to do. But because he wasn't completely obsessed with his job and trying to figure out what he's trying to figure out. He had a little bit of space to, to experiment and then he invented stainless steel, which is like, everybody uses it now for your right. forks and spoons and all that. And same for, you know, um, penicillin and just all kinds of accidental, Kevlar, LSD. like, yeah, yeah <laughs> right, right. So a lot of great things happen when, you know, you're trying to do something and you're working very hard and then something a little bit crazy happens beside. So, you know, I, I have like, suggested things that we can work on with my friends but like the real magic is what what do they do on the side you know like um so slack was invented when they were trying to make like a video game something and then in the process of doing that they were like oh the chat sucks let's fix the chat and then they realize shit the chat is better than the game and then they hmm. focus on the chat hmm. so i don't want to over fixate on the what it, is it that we make mm-hmm. i just believe that if we get enough of the right people in the right context and you just challenge them to pursue their own curiosity and ambition. Each day, everybody should focus on what they think is most interesting and exciting and they should share it with everyone else. And then somebody else will notice, hey, that's cool, but what about this? And then like, oh, fuck, we can, we can right. do something new. You know? right. And then that's, that's what I want. 
So it's kind of an, it's, it's the indirect answer. It's a very, it's optimizing for some serendipity, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you can't really point to what it is. Have you, but, have you heard uh, Tyler Cowen ever? Because he uses this phrase, mm-hmm. optimizing for serendipity. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm for I'm I'm not I, ha, I don't maybe I've heard the phrase and then I'm using it because I remember it, but uh-huh. uh, I don't think I read it. But right. yeah, I agree with his. Right. And he has a few riffs like this that I agree with. He also talks about he also talks about how like one of the most high high impact things you can do with your life is to just challenge smart people to be more ambitious. Mm-hmm. You Notice know, they might think, oh, I should go and work at Facebook and I can make a lot of money, and then you'd be like, that's cool, or you could do something bigger right like it's just people just don't realize they can do th- bigger and bigger things and so right. you have to like if someone is just going around telling people hey why not do more why not do better why not do faster you know like that can be of incredible social value hmm. um so yeah he, so here's another question i have okay so mm-hmm. now i figured out that visa is somebody who's like listen historical vestige historical vestige we need to look into the future we'll have, we have to figure it out we don't necessarily have to borrow right so Visa is somebody very willing to be critical of what exists. Also, what Visa tells me is that as far as what must exist in the immediate future, I am willing to figure it out organically as I grow. And this sort of yeah. allows me to figure out that Visa is ex- what is so fresh about your Twitter is exactly sort of that part, right? And then there is other stuff. But my my question is, uh, in doing so, how is it? Help me resolve this doubt. I think you you interact with Twitter in a way that's extremely novel, right? Mm-hmm. Be that your 10, 1000 day a word kind of thing that you were doing where you were practically writing what I would yeah. say more towards the literature end of things than, Oh, this is my opinion yeah. about black lives matter kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, how is it that you see Twitter that is so different from everybody else seeing Twitter and how does, why does that impact me? Why does that make me take Twitter more seriously? Not in the sense of more politically seriously or any of that. Like you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, it's just, it's just, um, that's a good question. It's, well, so again, this is, this circles back a little bit to the Singapore thing where it's, uh, a lot of what I do is things that feel completely obvious and normal to me. Mm. And I don't realize that how uncommon or unique it is until right. other people tell me that nobody else does what you're doing. Right. Uh, but so for me, you know, I would say when I was a child, going to the library was a religious experience. Like it was just like every book is, is a history. It's a universe that somebody put together. And, you know, so again, I describe libraries as like, uh, they're like churches to the, to the light of human consciousness, right? Any kind of book, science, philosophy, art, whatever. And, so I've always just wanted to participate in that. And so, and I, I guess I've also always believed in like the law of large numbers. I think um, people don't appreciate. So people's intuitions, are, again, they're they are like inherited and they're inherited from a slower time, from an old human. Most people think about, most people's brains are only, you know, I mean, or their minds or whatever, they only think about a few hundred people, like their, their families, their friends, the people in their city. You know that there are some other people somewhere in the world, but like, you know, you don't really think specifically about them. Whereas for me, I'm always thinking like, I might have to talk to 10,000 people before I find someone who is like a soulmate. Like when I say soulmate, I mean like a, you know, Lennon McCartney or like a Simon Garfunkel or, you know, Ben and Jerry, right? Like just, right, right, just right. The, somebody else who understands you so well and they challenge you <laughs> to be better and you challenge them to be better and together you make really great stuff. So I've always loved really great stuff. Like when you encounter really great things, you're like, wow, like, you know, you, some people spend their life, spend their time digging around doing nothing. And some people build cathedrals, some people build rocket ships. Like, and so if I have a choice, I would like to be working on cathedrals and rocket ships. I don't know what my cathedral is going to be, but I would like to be that. And then, okay. So to do that, I need to meet someone else who is like me. And I, some people don't, I've encountered people who are similar and that they would like to work on that kind of problem, but they don't believe that other people like them exist. And I feel like there are 7 billion people in the world. For you to say that someone else doesn't exist is ignorant. It's like, it's just, you've it's like, you know, I think somebody said with regards to like, is there alien life in the world? It's like, it's like taking a cup of, taking a cup and then like um, scooping up a cup of ocean water and saying, oh, there, there are no blue whales in the ocean, you know, because I've checked. 
There's, there's no, there's no, right? right. But I've, and so everybody checks one cup of water and then they decide, oh, the ocean is boring, right? So, mm-hmm. so Twitter is an ocean, right? And most people take out one cup of water, decide it's full of anger and noise and whatever. And so they give up. But I, I feel like I just know that there must be life in the water. And so I'm just trying to extract as much water as I can and go deep diving and just keep searching for it. Mm. And I was willing to... Now, now in a, you know, at the time, it was scarier, I guess, when I was like 23 or 24 and I didn't have the audience that I have now. But I was always like, if I give up, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. I feel like if I had decided that, you know what, like um, dreaming of a better future is, is like a fool's game. It's a, it's a naive, idealistic thing. Either you're born a lottery ticket winner or you're not. And if you're not, you should face reality and stop pretending. Like I, I, I didn't want to do that. I felt like if I did that, you know, like too, I don't want to be too dramatic about it, but I do feel like if that was not an option, I would feel like life is not worth living. Like for me, like I just, like, and you know, I, like that can sound very dramatic, but I just felt like either life can be lived with passion and excitement and, and, you know, just glorious adventure. Like I was sold on that adventure. You know, I watched the movies, I read the books, you know, I feel like, I feel like when I was reading books as a kid, like the implicit message in the law of the rings or in whatever it is that you read, the implicit message is life can be an amazing adventure. I, I believe that. And, you know, then I, I started work and I saw that day, daily life was not an adventure. It was an ordeal. But I wanted to believe that if I make, you know, it's like, uh, have you watched like Shawshank Redemption? Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, if, if you slowly kind of pick at the prison hole every day, every day for 10 years, and then eventually you can break out of the prison that you're in and you can see what the world is like. And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, I don't want to live and die in prison without having tried like I'm going to try and if I die trying and it doesn't work out like okay la, you know I, I did what I could you know I, I tried my best but yeah so I just kept digging and digging I was mentally prepared to think that I wouldn't see any kind of success until maybe my 40s like I mm. thought that you know it's going to take years right like and I'm amazed that you know I basically started when I was about 22 and I did it kind of part-time I wasn't I, was, I wasn't you know some people have stories like oh I woke up every morning at 5 a.m to write and or work out I wasn't really that that obsessive you know I was like like three out of four days sometimes I wouldn't write anything at all you know sometimes just playing video games I'm not I'm not like super productive but I I have committed to persisting over decades you know like I'm willing to do I just it's just this is my hobby like, I'm willing to talk with one internet stranger every day for the rest of my life. And maybe right. in 2060, I will meet my Lennon McCartney. Like, so what? If I'm, if I'm 70 years old and I meet like that person, then with the next five years of our life is going to be so amazing. So right. that has always just felt kind of obvious to me. And mm-hmm. I keep running into people to whom it's not obvious. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a bit weird. So no, but, yeah, let me, let me, um, so I'm at this point, <laughs> I am a little, how do you say upset that do you, you don't speak any Hindi at all? Do you? Not yet. Not I've yet. been trying to learn. A, I've been trying to learn a little bit. I feel like it's important to learn because I think India is going to be a very important uh, country in the world. I have like right. a notes okay. document with, you know, like, a, but yeah, I don't, I, I, I can understand like one or two words here and there, right. you know, but like, not really. right. A lot of my content, which is primarily Hindi. Um, if I could have shown it to you, you would have, you would have probably felt more of a, how would you say resonance? Because I I, I nice. resonate with the idea when you say it is it is either um, an adventure or it's nothing or I'm dying. Like I was I was uh, riffing off with somebody recently about Fifty Cent's album title. What is it? Get rich or die Get trying. Get rich or die trying. Yeah. Right? I think it is profound. Die trying is yeah. such an interesting idea, and yeah. I was just like, bro, yes. you you need to understand this. Like I was going off over that. So yeah. uh, I think the adventure ordeal articulation that you just did, right? Like a light that. Part of me probably ate up the idea life has to be an adventure. And therefore the audio yeah. is something I wouldn't settle for is resonant yeah. with me. So thank you for doing that. But I'm awesome. I, I'm curious as to like, h- how is it that you see Twitter? Like when I, when I think of YouTube, I think of YouTube as my personal microphone. I go on YouTube. I'm like, hello, listen to me. Here is what I have to say. And I leave I mic drop right. and I walk out. Right? right. And so for, for me, it is not a social media. I'm not trying to really get popular or anything. What I'm trying to do is do my thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, can, can one see Twitter as um, a, a, a journaling platform of some nature? And the reason why I ask this question is because I think up until now, we've been thinking of social media as an extension of the physical space. 
at okay. this point i think it is no longer viable to think of social media as an extension of the physical space it is a digital space separate from physical space and the case that i would make for it is something like this now recently with the whole thing that the black life matter thing that's happening in america everybody started doing this hashtag blackout tuesday thing on instagram Mm-hmm. Within a few hours of that happening, everybody jumps on. Is like, what are you doing? You're drowning out relevant information. And what seems to be the case is that what would have worked in the physical plane of real life, which is solidarity through mass agreement, does not right. seem to be a viable rule on social media, because that has different consequences. The dynamics of communication are different. It acquires like. there is a differential set of rules between the digital and the real and we figured out the rules for the real but we are so bent on the idea that the digital is an extension of the real that we aren't figuring out independent rules for the digital and i think some mm. part of you intuitively has in some sense i think some part of me intuitively everybody intuitively kind of sort of gets it but we haven't really sat down to be like like why is social media psychology not an academic discipline already why can i not oh, yeah, quote tweets in my academic papers already like uh, yeah. why are we so deluded that twitter yeah. does not exist it's bloody real you see what yeah. i mean some of the in- the most interesting thoughts i have are not from reading kant and kant is nice i like reading him right yeah. i i have yeah. them i i get it from like i get it from uh, eric weinstein's instagram uh, youtube page oh so, twitter, sorry uh, yeah. twitter page right i see yeah. particularly something like that and i'm like fan mm-hmm. fucking fantastic bro like, right. you so you see what i mean okay. and i okay. i just i just genuinely think that this divorce that you have you did not take right. the vestige you were like twitter is a different world stop telling me it's just your political opinion kind of a space yeah. i do me there like wh- so mm-hmm. is there something in that direction that you've kind of sort of figured out that i have into the world yeah. hasn't ah i had dinner with eric weinstein by the way in uh, in in may last year no. and it was because it was because of twitter it was because uh, i had twitter friends in san francisco who liked my tweets and they wanted me to So like one of my friends Mason she was organizing a dinner with a bunch of people and he Weinstein was there uh, a couple of other people Sam Harris was there uh Mark Andreessen was there it was like a pretty and you know they're all normal people that's the interesting well, I, I was kind of surprised I thought I was I don't know what I've I was expecting with, I've hung out with Eric once as well and I think he's a fantastic yeah. man He's a, Him, he's a, yeah he's a very very articulate and he absolutely. has a very deep knowledge of history like his his history reference game is really off the hook like hang, having so having dinner with him once made me want to go home and read more history mm. you know and that's the thing about that's the the crazy like it's not like i feel like i have homework or i feel it's just you witness somebody else and they are able to mention historical references in conversation you're like wow that is so cool it's so relevant it's so interesting it's so use everyone at the everyone at the dinner, dinner table is enjoying you know all these relevant nuggets of information and like yeah i could do that like the only reason i haven't done that is because it didn't occur to me that it would be worth my time to do it but like if i'm going to be meeting interesting people for conversation then it's worth studying history and then if i'm doing it to impress my friends along the way i may learn something that helps me right so it's like this this beautiful virtuous cycle of all the cool things that can possibly happen hmm. but like yeah so you're asking about twitter um what was it again exactly like so, how am i seeing it differently so, yeah so like what is it that like you know how i described how we can no longer see it as just an adjunct to the r- real physical space that it is a sort of a space right. unto its own own self right do you mm-hmm. have you have you sort of had an understanding of twitter something like that like do you see this as a public text messaging a conch i see twitter as a hive mind discovering itself for instance as a hypothetical sure. right? like, that's that's I, i i think there are many valid um models that you can use to model twitter and it's it's you know it's infinitely complex so that's like you that you can have a thousand different models that are all correct in describing twitter how i think about it i think there was a quote from i'm not sure if it was uh steve wozniak somebody who said when he was a child um he decided to become a ham radio operator which is a like that manual radio set that right casual radio set Yeah right. and it works on the it's free and it works on the actual radio frequencies mm-hmm. and you can use you know he's a child he's like maybe 10 or 11 right and he builds it with his dad he gets his license and then he calls it I, i'm not i'm not sure if the story i'm remembering is correct or if i'm i'm like adding you might be because i think i've kind of sort of heard of the story as well but please finish vaguely yeah i might right. be confusing it with something else but like you know just, just imagine the even if it's a fictional story like the, the resonance is real which is right. imagine being a child about 10 years old and then you put together a bunch of physical uh, you you buy this this box with screws and bolts and you put it all together then you press the button and say hello i am you know 
Visagan, I'm Praga or whatever. I'm 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 so and so. Is anybody is anybody there? Right. And then the captain of a ship out at sea, maybe like a navy, like a admiral. You know, the captain of a ship says, "Hi, this is Admiral So and So from the U.S. Navy, and I, I hear you. What are you doing?" And then the kids like, "Oh my God, fuck!" Like you know, it's like <laughs> this little this this toy, right? This thing I'm playing with has just made me an equal with. Hmm. The admiral of a navy ship, of a of a you know whether it's a destroyer or aircraft carrier, or whatever. Like you're both speaking to each other as equals. Uh, I think Jim Carrey has a story as well. When he was a kid, he liked a TV show on TV, and then he wrote in to he wrote like a letter. He's like a seven year old kid or whatever. Right? He writes a letter. Hi, I'm Jim Carrey. I like your show very much. Thank you for whatever. And then they send him back like a. You know, it's it's like the response to fan mail, and it's kind of like it's probably formulaic. It's like, oh, thank you for your letter. We appreciate it. Here are some stickers, whatever, whatever. And then you know, the 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 letterhead says like the TV show, and then it's addressed from Hollywood. And at seven years old, he's like, I got a letter from Hollywood. It becomes the most precious thing to him, right? And it's that feeling of previously I was alone. Previously I'm some unknown kid, and here I am in correspondence with the greatest of the greats in the world, right? And I feel like uh, the internet for me has always been like there has been that promise of that, and Twitter is by far the most direct. You can literally at mention anybody. You could at mention Tim Cook, right? You could at mention the president, Act, whatever, whatever. right? Yeah, right? you can. Right, you can. I mean, well, be careful with that. They, they, yeah. <laughs> so those, like, you know, so presidents and and CEOs, like those guys, the the super top zero point one percent, they might not respond, but uh-huh. like the top five percent or so. They are they're likely they are more likely to respond than you might think, as long as you put in the effort to tell them something or ask them something that they think is interesting. So a thing that I always I've always believed is that you know so I've always thought like there is a certain injustice in the world like uh, and it's a very it's a very teenage angsty kind of private thing which mm. is like. I'm I'm pretty smart, you know. I'm right. kind of smart. I'm I'm kind of cool, you know. I right. I like me. My friends like me, right. right? But why am I? Why why is nobody introducing me to important people? You know right. why why am I not? You know. And so I've always believed that, you know. And because I used to read all the books and I I, I have all this knowledge and I feel like, you know. And I would watch videos of, uh, I don't know, man. Like just just I I I I would see like paparazzi harassing a celebrity, for example. I'm like, that's such a shitty experience. Like they're famous, but they're getting harassed by nonsense. I'm like, I'm sure the celebrity would like a really good friend. I'm sure they still have space in their lives for a really good friend who is, you know, who's respectful, cares about them, understands their work. You know, it's not like a crazy fanboy who's like, oh my god, you're so great, I worship you. But more of like, hey, you know, I read your book. All These right. ideas are really cool. I would you I think you would also like that book you know mm, and mm. Like, that kind of thing like like and because I also feel like I have always appreciated any effort anybody puts into having a conversation with me like if they put in the effort you know if it's not just some random whether it's a fanboy or a hater like those people are like they don't really care who you are they just mm-hmm. just like the idea the idea right. of you but if they like your work and they engage with your work I've always believed that every creative mind is fundamentally playful and wants to play with other creative minds. I've always mm. believed this. And so, like when you have Twitter, I guess how I think about it slightly differently is that I don't see it as it's a general space. I mean, it is, so it is a general space. It is a public commons, but I think of it as I have the opportunity to shoot my shot, to be connected with some of the greatest mm. people in the world. And that's the real game that I'm playing. So, you know, even right. when I'm tweeting, like, and, and they would have mutual friends. So I got the, are you familiar with uh, David Deutsch? No. So David, David Deutsch is kind of, uh, so some of the, I'm, I'm guessing some people who like Taylor would also like David Deutsch. He's a physicist based in the UK. He has a book called The Beginning of Infinity. And he's mm. like, just this pretty highly respected author slash lecturer who talks mm. about, he talks about like advanced physics and he talks about like theory of knowledge and you know, how to, how to advance humanity and how blah, blah, right. blah. Like, like a lot, a lot of people are really into his ideas. Mm-hmm. And I did a book thread about his book. I, I do a lot of book threads. I have like 50, 60, maybe 70 plus book threads now where I read a book and then I tweet about the book as I'm reading it. Like, oh, this is an interesting quote. This is an interesting Insane. point. Insane. Good right. idea. Right. I, I do it all the time. And there have been at least three or four instances where someone retweets it, or I don't know if the author searched for it, but the authors find the book threads and they reply and they, they, they say things. And turns out I have a mutual friend with David Deutsch uh-huh. and they 
introduced us and we they set up a video call and I did a video interviewing the author of a book that I read who's uh-huh. like and you know, you know you know I say interview but actually when I presented it to David as an idea I presented it as a conversation and because I knew again that he must be so tired of doing all these king interviews where people say tell me about your book right, what are your right. ideas tell me about and I'm like hey you know like I'm I'm I I I can see, I I see you I see that you are a curious playful mind I'm one of you I'm just younger right, right. <laughs> and I'm not I'm, I'm not as gifted in physics but right. I'm curious like you and I have questions and I want to know what you think about things and you know and you know I spent a, like the first 5 10 minutes of my call talking about myself which most people would think is not is all some people would think it's disrespectful they're like why are you wasting this important person's time with your life story right and some people and you know I, you can go and look up the video yourself and on youtube and there are people in the comments who are like david doish fanboys and they're like who gives a shit about this interviewer that nobody knows like fuck off like, i want to i'm here to see david talk like cut the crap right but, right 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 but i don't care about them you see i care about david mm. and i want david to have a good time having a conversation with me mm. and for him to have a good time having a conversation with me he has to know my context like you know he has to know where i'm coming from and like he he referenced stuff that i said at the beginning of the call like an hour later into the call so he remembered so it's not like he was you know it was it was genuinely a conversation right and you know i feel like i feel like that is something i probably can't even tweet about because it would sound like i'm trying to show off that i'm friends right. with a famous person right. but i'm not i i'm really really not i'm really trying to say, it's it's so radical people don't people don't believe this is true but it's true mm. the most important and powerful people in the world some of them they are like lonely they're lonely because everyone's fucking worshiping them right. and they're not uh, worshiping them or demonizing them and no one's having an honest face to face conversation with mm. them about like what their stuff is so right. i have found repeatedly with some of the most busy and wealthy and important people in the world that they are curious to hear what i have to say because they know that i don't want their money i don't want mm. their investment or their right. you know i don't i just want to chat about ideas and they got to where they are because they did that they cared about ideas and that made them successful and right. it's a kind of twisted irony that when you become successful now everyone cares about why you are successful and right what, what what's your morning routine do you drink coffee do you like and they're like fuck off i don't care you know like this like let's talk physics or let's right. talk you know what's just the future of of um, you know that kind of thing you've and, got to challenge these guys yes like yeah that's and how they, they appreciate it. it right exactly exactly and you know i it's if i can get a few thousand people to uh, to understand that this is true and they conduct themselves like that they will then each become like nodes in their networks that spread curiosity and and engagement and whatever and just this each person can be a network that influences mm. the people around them and then we can envelop the whole fucking world and then anybody who's working on anything interesting through like this hand system of handshakes between friend and friend like just information will be routed it should already be true but it's not happening because of like the way our social media platforms are organized and the assumptions people have about just human relations right mm. like it's all bullshit and everything can ah uh, it's just crazy it's <laughs> it's really every everybody should be thinking from first principles what do you really want to do with your life right. who do you want to be friends with who do you want to talk to and not just because they're famous you know so i like like you know um my favorite musical artist of all time is hayley williams from paramore and for mo- a range of reasons you know she's she has this embodiment of like vulnerability in public and sharing feelings and and she creates this very nourishing vibe that everyone involved is very supportive and all those things and so i rehearse with myself like the conversation i would have with her Hmm. I would and people say things like oh if you meet her aren't you going to like lose your shit and be a fanboy I'm like no because I respect her so much that I don't want her to feel like she has to manage me you know like if if somebody comes at you like oh my god I love you you're like oh thanks you know yeah, like, right. you, you you enter that mode like oh I hope thank you for liking my show but I'm right. like you know I used to read your live journal and I loved how you handled the crowd and I want to know how did you deal with x you know what mm. did you think about y and you know like ask right. them the questions that like, you read all of their interviews and you see what nobody has asked them yet mm. and then when you ask them a really good question that nobody has asked them before they will you know they have this script right how to deal with all these people who want my attention and when you give them a question that they've never been asked before that they find interesting they will have to stop and they'll be like ha huh, that's a good question nobody's asked me that before like let me think about it and then they will like you like i've i've witnessed this happening and they want to be your friend because you just introduced that you gave them a gift you introduced them to 
an area that they can play with creatively that right. nobody else was giving them. And we can all do this for each other. And we can all, like, your status doesn't matter, you know, right. where you are, right. how much money you have. It, none of that shit matters. It's just, it's just playing with ideas and perspectives. And, you know, even who you are doesn't actually matter, right? It can be anonymous or whatever. It's just... Now we're back to LSD. Uh, <laughs> yeah, basically, so, basically, it's. I mean, I, I sense that um, I've stretched you enough, so I'm going to bring this to a close about right now. Uh, but I have, I have right. a few things to say. Um, you know, have you heard of the heard of the phrase? Uh, the reputation precedes the person. Yeah. But the first time I heard that, I was like, "What kind of a life is that? Like, what, what what's the point if what people say about me?" is more relevant. Like, you know what happens with, and I've only recently begun to see this because I've only recently sort of started to become like a social media kind of a person where people sort of know me. And I get, every time I get a text where somebody's trying to fan mail me, it is more difficult for me to respond because they're not addressing me as a person. They're addressing yeah. my capital as a person. And yeah. there is a difference between who I am and what my capital is. And it becomes extremely difficult. I think part of the problem of taking your personality to, to the, to the internet or to the public square, instead of creating a character is that the mm. internet begins to shape your personality. And I think that might have been yeah. something like, I, I, you, you might have felt something similar with yourself yeah, as well because you're so I, I, Yeah, I, 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 I think about this all the time because, uh, you know, so like one of my favorite acts that I've encountered recently is uh, ContraPoints, the YouTuber. And oh, so her, yeah. name is Nat, her name is Natalie Wynn and she, her, her show is called ContraPoints. Right. And so there's that, there's that gap between people say, oh, ContraPoints is trash. Right. And it's like, there's, there's that gap. It's not, it's not Natalie is trash. I mean, so some people will say Natalie is trash, but most people who don't like ContraPoints say ContraPoints is trash. And she can be like, oh, well, you know, you don't like my work. It's that's not like you don't like me. Me, right? right. Yeah, there's, right. There's, that, there's that gap. That's healthy. And, uh, you know, but I'm not yet at the scale where it's going to really kind of crucify me. But I, I, I always study these things in advance. I'm always studying celebrities and politicians and famous people to see how they handle it psychologically. Because right. I don't think that, uh, you know, some people will say things like, it's worth, you know, if you have a good cause that you believe in, it's okay if you ruin your life in the process because you serve right. that greater good. I don't think that's, no, nah, I don't. I'm, I'm not persuaded by that. I feel like <laughs> ultimately like life you. is right. Right. Ultimately, life is a journey. You know, in the grand, grand scheme of things, the universe is going to fade to nothing. So, right. your legacy will be, you know, Ozymandias. It will be sand and dust and whatever. I mean, some people have disagreements about that. They're like, oh, maybe we can reverse entropy and then re <laughs> regardless, like you shouldn't live a miserable life to achieve something. So, like, right, I, yeah, I, right, right, right. And mm -hmm. uh, so, it's very important to me to not be miserable. <laughs> Mm. And so um, I, you know, I, I describe what I do sometimes or you know, just the, the pursuit of being a public figure is an extreme sport. It's a psychological mm. extreme sport because mm. you are taking your ego and your personality and your identity and you're subjecting it to extreme stress. It's like, mm. you know, uh, like going, like driving a sports car, whatever that's like the G force is on you. Right. And the thing about that kind of G force is like weightlifting, right? If your, if your posture or your form is wrong, you're going to screw your back. Right. Yeah, so same, yeah. same like psychologically, if you're going to be a public figure, you're going to be subjected to intense scrutiny, intense pressure, intense other people's projections. It's going to really weigh on you and you have to take the weight and handle it properly. So I'm very mindful of making sure that I do it properly. Um, and the most important thing for that, I think, is you have to have your own sense of values. You have mm. to have your own sense of what you will not do, what you like. So, you know, like uh, I have an ebook now and people buy my ebook. And so if I tweet about my ebook, people buy more of the ebook. So, you know, if I want more money, if I, if I, if right now you told me visa, I need you to make a hundred dollars in the next hour. I, I can actually do that. I can go and tweet about my book and, right. and, and like people will buy it. But the thing is, if I do that every day, people will start to see me as, why is this guy just talking about his book? He's trying to sell stuff. Like he's a, sales, right. he's like a marketing guy. You know, right. so there's, there's, if, if I overdo that and then, you know, I can think about what kind of controversy can I cook up so that I can sell more eBooks, right? There's, it's possible. I can see the path. It's like right. it's the, the low road or whatever. Right. And right. a lot of, a lot of people who don't have their own personal sense of values and they don't have a vision for the kind of life they want to live, it's very easy to be like, well, more money is nice and then I can buy creature comforts or I can buy status or whatever. So let's just do the thing that has more money. Right. And then, you know, you, you start, I call it summoning the demon. You know, it's mm. like you're, mm. to, to make money, you're willing to like create outrage or create whatever it is. Even if it's right. just, you know, 
create feuds, whatever. And yeah, you make the money, but you at the cost of your soul. And and uh, I've seen it play out in other people, and they are not happy. So you really have to figure out what it is that you that you won't compromise on. And for me, I I choose. I think the trick is, and this is also an answer to another question that you asked earlier that I didn't mention before, which is like you're asking about like the the Black Lives Matter stuff and all that. And you know, there's like there's like there's there's day to day frictions. There's like oh, you know, in June 2020, in the first week, there were protests in the states about racial injustice, and you know, it's a tragedy or whatever. But like, you know, I care about those things, and I and I want to see things get better for people, and I want to see more justice, and I want you know all of those things. Like you 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 can you you know what's up. Right, but right, like, right, right. <laughs> I also try to have a very long view. You know, I try to think about these things in, in like a hundred year scale. Mm. And when you start to think about things at a 50 to hundred year scale, like what happens day to day, week to week, even year to year doesn't really matter. Like things right. can go wrong. It's all right. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying that it's all right that people are struggling and, and losing their lives and all those things, but I'm saying something like, you know, so like I wanted to travel, I wanted to be in New York this month and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So I can't. But it's okay. You know, it's, it's, it's sad, but like, that's it's not right. gonna, right, right. because my plan is, my plan is a, it's an 80 year plan. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I can't, tra if I can't travel for 10 years, that's fine. I'll travel on year 11. Like, you know, right. it's just, when you have that kind of long view, it makes life a lot easier. You don't need, yeah. you know, if people, like people are arguing with you today or they're misunderstanding, you're like, okay, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just, I, I'm playing the long game. You know, I'm, right. I'm not, I don't need, I don't need to win this argument with you. I'm trying to win your loyalty and support over decades. It's not right. important to be right. It's important to be right eventually. And I think that makes yeah. all the difference, right? So, yes. and so many, let's, I mean, I, I would rather not get into it, but I've seen so many people, especially on Twitter, wanting to be right so badly, they entirely miss the point of their engagement. And, um, yeah. I, uh, of the many ideas that I write down for myself, I have an entire notebook uh, I like to keep so that I preserve how I've thought over the course of time, right? Like it's Great. a connection with my history that I privately keep. And one of the ideas that I recently wrote down and I sort of started working on is a book called The Play Principle, which mm. I think uh, throughout this conversation, you in your own way have been uh, talking about like I think what you truly I don't know if you've read about the psychological concept of play it's sort of different from our conventional yeah, concept playfulness, of play, but, yeah. right yeah right and there's a playful orientation to life in the most practical sense yeah. that's the book idea that I was thinking about I think I think you are onto that in your own sense and yeah. I think what yeah same if you document that process, which in, in, a, in a very meta sense, you are already on Twitter I think that yeah. is a book that I can totally expect you to write what yeah. is tragic about this conversation is, um, and I mean that in a funny way, is that I could not, like, I could not mention how deeply I resonated with the way you operate in life. I could not find a way to do that. And I cannot find a post hoc way either because a lot of the content that you'd see from me is in Hindi, right? So whenever you are ready, uh, you can, you can sort of, I also speak in English and Hindi and I mix it up a little bit. So you'll find it very right. comprehensible, but it has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Believe right. me, I am never this silent. I am known as the person who does not get out of the interviewee's way. Like, so uh, right. this has been fantastic. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, wait, uh, before that, I just want to yes, say please, that, please. you know, so you were saying there's no post talk way, but again, that's the beautiful thing about the long game, mm -hmm. which is that over, if you, if you continue to do what for you're doing sure. for 10 plus years, right. there will be things in between, you know, right. it's like, a, I describe it as, you know, when you find your personal resonance within yourself with your own aesthetics and your own values and your own beliefs, you can't hide it from the world around you. Like people will be drawn to you because they can feel that that guy is living his truth in a right. sense, right? It sounds wooey, Beautiful. but it's actually no, no, very no, no, concrete. No. No, I'm it's very that. concrete. You mm -hmm. can see it in the person's face. You can see it in their body language and their voice that they mean what they say, right? Mm. And if you keep doing that and you, know, you keep doing what you're doing in Hindi and I keep doing what I'm doing in English, like mm -hmm. there will be people who, who draw don't the know that we've, yeah, they won't know that we've had this conversation, but there will be people telling me, hey, you should check out that guy. And that guy right. will say, you should check out that guy. And then we'll right. be like, oh, we've met, we've spoken, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, as things go on. So again, if you're playing a really, really long game, you know, right. some people are sometimes ask me like, why do you spend an hour talking to some stranger on the internet? I'm like, because it's an investment. There's a chance that it's, it's, it's a, like a small fractal version right. of the big thing, which is that right. maybe, maybe this wouldn't have worked out, but if it did, it's, it will pay off down the line in ways that we can't see. Right. Interesting. 
Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, and it's an exciting way to live life. It's fun. Right. It's playful. It's just, it's you high. Feel, it's, uh, it's, it's, taking, it's taking uncertainty seriously, right? The ultimate yeah. psychological fear is uncertainty. And if you take, like for me, one of the ground, the, one of the ground principles I have is anything that offers me false or even like a projected sense of certainty, even a horoscope, even as a casual joke, never. I will take uncertainty seriously and I will figure it out as I go and I will document the process of how I figured it out so I can then outsource it to the people who find a difference between the theoretical and the practicals of life. Like then I can tell you how to mix them together. That's what I really do. So I, I read all the science up. I figure out all the things in the theory and then I, re- and I do my thing on the side, first principle. And then I see how nice. they come together and that's what I present to people. That's what I'm fairly decent at. But it has been incredible cool. talking to you. Awesome. It's been fun. Yes. Oh yeah. And I guess uh, that I should plug my stuff. So right. uh, if I am going to do that regardless, me. but please do that. Yes. <laughs> right. So if, if you've enjoyed this conversation, um, you can follow me on Twitter, which is uh, twitter.com slash Visagan V V I S A K A N V. And uh, in my Twitter bio, there's a link to my ebook friendly ambitious nerd. You don't have to buy it, but like, you know, the, the ideas that are here, I express through that. So if you like this conversation, you'll probably like that. Right. I will make sure, I mean, my episode will have your Twitter link almost throughout right underneath you. So that'll be there. And uh, awesome. the, the book link isn't going to be in the bio in case somebody's looking for it. Thank you so much, Visa. Thank, I've had Thank a great you. time. I have had a great time as well.